Hello, this is Techman88, and this is going to be yet another video on a cobble farm that I'm making. This is basically almost the same design that I've showed previously, but I added a couple improvements. Um, and I'll try and go through those real quick and then go in detail a little bit later. I think this is just about ready to build in a survival world, so I will provide a world download, and it's not going to be a huge one. It's just going to be this machine right here. And I'll try and uh, link in the description to the various timestamps of the different parts of this in case you just want to see one part. Now I saw that Il Mango and uh, Little Mouse, or Mouse, uh, they worked on a pretty similar system to this. I think they were getting about 220 cobble for, per TNT or log per TNT. I think they're focusing on logs. One thing I did on this is I made an item counter for 1.13 because I don't think any of the old designs work because they changed a couple of important commands. So basically there's this hopper here and there's a command over here that detects whether there's 64 items in the first slot. And if it detects those 64 items then it does this new command. Uh, this data merge, I think it used to be block data. So that just clears the first slot, it fills the rest of the slots one, two, three, and four with uh, with cobble, like a full stack of each one of those. Then it does a couple increments over here to count the number of cobble and the number of stacks. And then I have a divider bit of logic over here, which gives a convenient count, a, a cobble per TNT over on this side. So if I drop in a couple stacks, so that was two stacks, Start at one, now it's three. Dropped in three more, now it's up to six. Another thing I did is I, I just copied the same design from Little Mouse, where it dispenses TNT directly into a slime block, and then it launches up like that. So that's a bit simpler. You don't need an extra piston to the side, side if you saw my previous version. Another thing I did is I figured out a way to figure out the exact explosion height of the TNT. Or pretty exact, I'm not sure if it's totally exact. And the way it works is I summon an armor stand right here, and then I teleport it to the nearest TNT. And that, right down here, it tells me exactly the height that I teleported it to. And this is the height that I'm using on my design. Uh, but I can change out the timings here. This is going to do it a little bit lower. That was 74.58. This is 73.49. So just a little bit farther down. And then I can adjust these timings a little bit more and get a different height. Another thing I was testing out is whether a flying machine could come underneath this and push blocks up to maybe get rid of these floaters down here. So I just have command blocks, I'm kind of cheating for this. And it just uh, summons pistons and then summons redstone below them. And that's just going to push up two blocks. Now I'm not very good at flying machines. This might be a Omega type of task. Uh, but this is what I was thinking to push up the floaters. So like say these are the floaters that are left below, like on the bottom couple layers. So this flying machine would come in and push them up two blocks, and then it would return. It's just a simple self-returning flying machine. And when you use a machine like that, it'll push these blocks up a couple more blocks, and then they have a chance to get pushed down by these blocks. So then when that happens, they get the zero block resistance. This is just a too wide example right here. If you're actually gonna build this, you'd probably wanna build it uh, nine wide or that's the width of the blast chamber so it'd come like way out here but I didn't want to get into that before I really determined if this is the right solution. I did build a slightly wider example just so you, uh, this is just one solution it's maybe the easiest solution because it uses that self-returning flying machine and I'll, I'll launch it with this button and this one get stopped by this block right here and then the the main flying machine the engine automatically turns around 
So that means you don't need um, you don't need like any machinery under here. You can just have a single obsidian block for the return station. On Il Mango and Mouse's version, they had a set of pistons on the other side, which would be arranged like this, and they would uh, they would somehow detect whether the blocks actually got pushed in and, and then get, push them back. So that seems to be their detection system. And I did this a bit differently. And there might be some advantages to this. One obvious one is the logic can be all on this side of the machine. And another advantage is that you might be able to have another pusher thing on this side. So you could reuse this, uh, most of this cobble farm. So the way this detection system works is there's an observer which detects whether this block can move. And if the block can move, it's going to disable this comparator just for that brief moment. Uh, and if it can't move, it's not going to disable this comparator. So into this comparator from the back is the, uh, the main signal that triggers it to push the pistons. There's another nice thing about using these observers is just because of how the logic works out, you can simply add more observers down here if you want to detect whether more than one row can't move. But the only row I actually have to test for is this row right here because this has a, uh, this just needs to be pushed out the most out of any other piston. And the rest of the logic on this machine is pretty much the same as I had on my previous version. It uses this chain of hoppers. There's one difference on this version. I used a, uh, a non-stackable item. So that puts out a signal length of uh, three. So it's, you don't need quite as many repeaters, but you still need quite a lot. It's not as fast as I'd like it to be. The last bit of logic that I changed is uh, like coming out from this comparator, which tells it to push down all the pistons. I have this uh, NOR latch gate or whatever it's called. And uh, see there's a main timer over here, which triggers quite often. And it sends a pulse down this line. And when this is pushed over, it's not going to let the signal go through. So uh, when this is on the position on the left, it tells it don't do anything until it's done with the current action. So you'll see why it's important in a second when it does the TNT. So now it's going to, you know, uh, next one. OK, so now it's doing the TNT, and this is locked and it's only going to re-enable when the pistons push down, which I just conveniently write off the actual pistons, which just uh, pushes this piston this direction. I'll, I will have the world download, of course, so you can look at this in more detail if you're really wondering. One improvement that I made, which I got inspiration from Il Mango and Mouse's design, which is to use these powered rails to trigger an observer below it. So I'll come down below and these are the middle three pistons that I can now push with all the pistons at once. So that each, each, this 9x9, nine nine, or 3x3 three three formation, it gets pushed down three times, which increases yields by uh, 27 per TNT. So yeah, there's an observer up here. And it doesn't matter the quasi-connectivity and all that, uh, because these are always getting pushed down with all the pistons at once. So it's uh, three times with all the pistons, and then three times with just these sticky pistons. One important thing I'd like to address for blast chambers like this is that uh, logs and cobble and uh, concrete, I think those are the things you want to maybe use with a machine like this. They, are, they have different blast resistance. So one thing is that floaters, like down here, they do have like these logs, they'll have a chance to get blown up by TNT. Like even if they're not moving. But a like a cobble, it's never going to get blown up if it's in this corner. Like down here or something like that. Like you leave that there forever. It's just not going to blow up unless it's getting pushed by pistons at the same time. So the floaters are definitely less of an issue in this type of farm if you're using, uh, if you're doing it for logs. I'll go through some of the controls real quick in case you want to try this in your own world. So this is the master on off switch and obviously I just turned it off. And then I have options. I can 
I can do this one, which is going to fill in the row next to the pistons. So this would be more like uh, tree farm input right now. And you can adjust the clock speed. You might possibly get problems if you try and set it too fast. If you're filling up the entire uh, entire layer. So yeah, you can see that's working. It is slower. I don't use this for the, the long-term testing because it's quite a bit slower. So now I can switch it back to filling full layers and you can edit this command in here to fill it with wood instead. So for, for filling the full layers, I use a slightly longer timing, a uh, six clock, just so that the, uh, the whole thing is a little more synchronized. I have a couple of commands on this side of the machine. Uh, this one will just clear all the wood and cobble out, and it's not going to accidentally replace pistons because it does the uh, replace air command. On the whole counting system that I set up, this kind of hacked together one, you do have to be careful about extraneous items in this hopper. It's only going to be able to count one item type at a time. So if you switch from logs to cobble or vice versa, You'll have, to, uh, you'll have to make sure that this first layer isn't filled up with the wrong item type. So easy way to do that is just to clear your inventory, come down into the hopper, then clear out the last item right there. And another part of this is the reset button that's right here. That'll just reset everything back to zero. Another thing you can turn on if you want is the simulated flying machine. And just put a redstone dust right here and that's going to trigger this line of pistons and you can see I cut it off right here so each one of these sections right here is a layer that it's going to push up so you can see the pistons get summoned right there and I can say make it only do the bottommost layer by by cutting out that repeater right there I'll end this with a time lapse so you can see what kind of testing goes into this type of machine. So these tests, they can take like 10 hours to do if you want to be really thorough. And for like wood that I tested last night, this, this is what I ran all night. And by the end of it, I can see if there is a problem because I have this time lapse of it, I can go to exactly when that problem was and kind of debug it that way. Now I guess some people are really going for maximum efficiency and they're getting like 99.98 and in my opinion that's to the point where it's not really worth it anymore. I think you should be probably happy with 99% and this that's about what this is getting. You can look at the cobble, for, cobble per TNT and once there's enough TNT exploded that's going to stabilize to a value and if you want to be really exact, you can divide cobbles by TNTs and get an exact value. And I think I got about 99.5%. Anyway, this is going to be it for this video. There is a world download in the description, so you can test it out. And I think it is just about ready to build in survival if you want to use it. I would suggest that you understand the system very well before you actually do that, because there is a, there's a lot to it. And you have to make sure you get like all the comparators right and the timings and the distances between TNT and you know all that type of stuff. It really has to be exactly how it is here if it's going to work.